we have um, Dominic here, uh, Dominic Hogg from Unomia Research. Uh, let me just unmute him. Uh, um, yeah, now he's unmuted. Hey, Dominic, can you hear us? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thanks, Dominic, for joining us. It's a pleasure. Yeah, good to see yeah. you. How are you? Yeah, good to see you again. Um, can you put the, yeah, yeah, the, um, a little further down? Sorry? Put the camera. Right there. Uh, can you put the camera further down? Yeah. Okay. So um, let me um, just introduce you and then um, give an introduction to the topic. And um, friends, so um, initially when we started the uh, discussion, there was some technical problems. So some of you might have not have heard the introduction, but um, let me just um, say that uh, we believe, um, so the, the reason we, we, we're talking about going beyond a circular economy is, uh, you know, uh, it has to become a new economic paradigm. And uh, we should remember the if, so if circular economy has to become a new economic paradigm by replacing our existing models, then we believe that um, its current vision is not bold enough to include some of the most important issues of our times, like consumption, which we just discussed with um, uh, Robert, poverty and inequality, and uh, being able to put a price on pollution. So um, that we are now. And when it comes to the uh, down now, and, and when it comes to the uh, format, um, today we have a slight uh, change in schedule. So uh, Alexander Lemel's uh, uh, panel is, uh, has been pre-recorded because uh, he couldn't make uh, this time. Um, and we really wanted his uh, views on, on the topic. So it's pre-recorded. And I'll send the email to everyone with a link to that um, uh, discussion <laughs> with uh, Dominic's uh, discussion. So um, thank you, Dominic, for joining us. And, uh, um, and again, sorry, <laughs> sorry. So to go back to the viewers, so if you have any questions or comments, use the hashtag waste dialogue and use the Q and A box um, at the top of uh, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, depending upon how many questions we have, we'll have about twenty minutes for Dom to answer them towards the end of this discussion. So with that, um, Dominic, welcome again. Um, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about your work, about yourself? You know, how did you get into this sector? How did you yeah, well, good to see you again. Last time I think yeah. we were in New York together. So um, uh, thanks for setting this up. And hello to everybody who's uh, um, managed to get online to to listen. So I, my uh, involvement, I mean, I used to be sort of, um, I used to play quite a lot of sport. And then um, I used to, uh, uh, my brother was a very good sportsman. He was a very good rugby player. And I uh, was sort of following in his footsteps. And then I had quite a serious injury at the age of 21. Uh, I almost died from a ruptured spleen. And uh, I was told by the surgeon I had to stick to Tiddlywinks so I needed to find something better to do. And I think I did. <laughs> so uh, I, um, I started to get involved in a lot of environmental campaigns, mainly, in, mainly at the time around tropical forest issues. Uh, I was teaching at the time. I gave that up to do a master's degree, which was around um, food policy and commodity trade. And uh, I then did a PhD at the University of Cambridge around the economics of technical change, on, uh, um, particularly focused on sea technologies and the role of biotechnology in potentially constraining genetic diversity in agriculture. And that still remains quite a strong passion of mine. Um, but one way or another, I ended up in a, in a consultancy and I now chair a company called Unobia, uh, which I set up 16 years ago. We now have around uh, 70, 75 staff in, uh, in London, Manchester, Brussels, um, Copenhagen, New York, and we have a, a small office in Auckland as well, in New Zealand. And well, our main emphasis is on waste and resource issues, but also low carbon energy, um, 
a sustainable business, particularly around supporting circular economy type models and resource efficiency, and also um, issues around natural capital and marine pollution, particularly marine plastic pollution, which we've uh, done quite a lot of work on recently. All right, great. Um, so uh, also congratulations on your um, setting up of a new office in the US. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, great. So uh, let, so so you got into um, all of this because you had nothing better to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to find something better to do. And being a, uh, a sort of beer swilling rugby player, so uh, um, yeah, it's probably done wonders for my liver as well as for my uh, <laughs> general state of well-being. But uh, yes, I um, that's how I came into. Uh, becoming a, a consultant as I am now. <laughs> Great, wonderful. So, um, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> by the way, I, don't, I should say, my my PhD thesis, perhaps not coincidentally, uh, was uh, uh, strongly related to this issue of path dependence and the, the nature of choice, and the fact that, as the Greek philosopher Heraclitus once said, you never step into the same river twice. And uh, I, it affects a lot of what I do. I think we we can we make choices, and we can't always unmake them because they're uh, very different. But equally, fate deals us some interesting uh, blows at times, and uh, I think we have to make the most of them. Right, right. Now, oh, uh, in that case, um, if you're talking about history, I think uh, Robert was a historian, is a historian, so you would have had a great chat with him. I would have. Um, and um, one of the things that led to this, um, um, to inviting you was we met um, at the UN um, Marine Plastics Conference and you were on the stage, you um, had a chance to speak, but it was just 15 minutes and there were like six other people who were all really good again. So um, I felt like we couldn't really hear a lot from you. So, you know, I thought maybe in this way, you know, we actually have some time, you know, good 45 minutes to be able to discuss different issues and, you know, go in depth. So uh, thanks for accepting. And uh, so let's start with uh, what circular economy. Um, how do you um, how do you differentiate them it from you know other environmental concepts and movements? Uh, so maybe we could start with that. Well, I suppose I mean you know a lot of people will say well this is nothing new, and uh, and I think there's some truth in that. But obviously there's been a resurgence, should we say, in interest in the concept of the circular economy. Um, it's what's been interesting about this sort of uh, aggressive uptake, if you like, of the circular economy over the last um, decade, I suppose, is that I think the profile of the concept has been raised and that's been really helpful. Um, I also think it's become uh, very clear that uh, the role of design, and I heard Robert talking about that earlier, um, becomes sort of centre stage. I think there's a there's some truth in the fact that when we've been talking about waste and resources, that there's been too much uh, by way of um, assuming that we simply have to deal with the waste as it comes at us. But of course, that's not true. And uh, if we start to emphasise and place um, push greater responsibility towards those who are uh, designing the things we consume. And I think um, we have a better opportunity to ensure that what consumption we do um, engage in is of a more sustainable nature. I think, uh, uh, so I think the circular economy has, has been very useful in, 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 in pressing that forward. Is it radically different? I, I'm not so sure. I think, um, uh, you know, we, it, 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 it's, um, it's important, obviously, that we, 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 it, it feels to me as though it embraces a lot of other concepts and um, uh, that, that we could describe in the environmental movement. We have various uh, people talking about resource efficiency, factor four, cradle to cradle, biomimicry and so forth. And indeed, the circular economy draws on all of those. Um, does it, is, is it entirely uh, consistent with all of those? I, I'm, I'm not sure. 
Um, right. I mean, uh, to be fair, um, practitioners of circular economy acknowledge its roots in you know different schools of thought, and um, all of which, um, all of those different uh, different schools of thought deal with um, you know living within the means of the planet while yeah. you know regenerating polluted places. Uh, but uh, um, like like you mentioned, you know, none of those um, have achieved nearly as much traction as circular economy, which has been really useful um, for you know everyone working in the sector. Um, so. Uh, and uh, in in this, so in our efforts to probably add to what's already existing in the circular economy, so that you know it could be a, um, we can piggyback, kind of piggyback on the traction that's already there. You know, we're just hoping that we could add. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's so, right. I mean, I, I think we could have quite an academic discussion about exactly where one ends and one concept ends and another begins. But I think the important thing is to galvanise some action because the, you know, the problems that are confronting us are, are pretty huge, and yep. uh, and unless we really start to grapple with them, um, then frankly we're all um, uh, we're, we're all in going to be facing a huge crisis in the future. And I think, if, well, I say in the future, I think we already are in one. And uh, so so um, so I think uh, whatever means can be used to probably engage people in this discussion and uh, not just in discussion but actually translating that into action is to be welcomed and frankly let's face it we, we have nowhere near enough action now no uh, no totally i agree um i mean uh, this has been very helpful to us uh, given the enormity of our uh, challenges that we face today so um uh, so talking about being practical and you know getting into action uh, getting to act um so and coming back to the topic today so uh, is is a price on pollution like carbon pricing possible you know if it is uh, who will be the key stakeholders that will make it happen and you know how do you think it could be implemented um, and is it happening? And I think um, it's happening in different countries through generally through emissions trading schemes. And those emissions trading schemes are mostly trying to ensure that there is a, a means to which they can be made compatible with each other. So it's not impossible to imagine a global trading scheme of sorts. Um, I suppose one of the uh, issues with some, some of the trading schemes out there, and of course they vary just in, in scope and design, is uh, first of all the scope, which in which activities, which industries are included and which are not, and also the uh, the extent to which where they are what are called cap and trade models, and they set an absolute um, uh, an overall quota within which people have to remain in terms of their trading. Um, whether those quotas are anywhere near tight enough, and of course. Uh, the Paris Agreement ought to be helping to, I suppose, tighten the caps that are implemented in the different emissions trading schemes that are there. But the other thing I think that's quite important, we live in a globalised world and um, obviously there's an interesting discussion about uh, how countries deal with and report on their emissions of uh, greenhouse gases. And under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, reporting under the Waste Chapter, is very narrowly focused on effectively landfill and biowaste treatment. And so the, the role that better resource management can play in uh, addressing the overall level of emissions um, associated with resource consumption is somehow obscured. Uh, and let me give an example of that, or I'll give a couple of examples. So for example, if, if I'm a major importing country and the United Kingdom is one, then actually much of the uh, emissions associated with what I'm actually consuming are not happening within the country. They're not associated with production within the United Kingdom. But of course, our inventories that we report to the to the UN are based around the activities of production within our country. Um, so we don't see um, some of the impacts of consumption because those emissions are effectively taking place in other countries. 
Now, of course, that's fine if, if lots of those other countries have their own uh, emissions performance standards and quotas to achieve. But if they don't, we're, they're effectively slipping outside of our, our, our site. And the second example would be um, where a country starts to engage in recycling. And again, I'll use the, the example of the UK. Suppose I'm importing primary aluminium from a country like Brazil. Um, the emissions don't appear on my inventory uh, because the, they've been, the production has taken place elsewhere. If, on the other hand, I start to recycle here in the UK, and I see the recycling happening in a, an aluminium smelting plant in the northwest of the UK, then I have some emissions that I'm going to record within my inventory. And so my, my inventory has worsened. But actually, in terms of global climate change emissions, I may have replaced an activity that generated 10 tonnes of CO2 with one that generates maybe half or one. And so, you know, the, the, the magnitude of the, the benefit isn't captured within the inventory. So what, what does that mean? It means unless we get to a system where we do have a global form of carbon pricing, uh, we're likely to be in some difficulty vis-a-vis -vis climate change. And in most of the materials when we're recycling, we know that generally one of the effects is that we reduce energy in certain margin. We ought to see uh, less greenhouse gas being generated. So what, what I'm concerned about is that if we don't capture the embodied emissions in our consumption, and if we don't actually price those into uh, to what we're doing, um, then we have a real problem. And so I think we can, we can go two ways with this. We can wait until um, the uh, global community puts in place, should we say, a global trading scheme. Or if we want, we could switch back. And I say switch back because many countries have considered this and um, but if, we've tended to end up more with emissions trading schemes and taxes. But I think the move back to a tax-based system and the reason why I think the tax-based system might be better is that I think we might be in a situation where we can better adjust for the carbon content of imports and exports as they move across country borders. And so if, for example, going back to my example, we're, we're importing a lot of primary material into the UK, um, I think we should tax the embodied carbon content of that import. Um, presumably, if we were to do that, we would also see a lower tax on imports where the embodied carbon content was lower, where, for example, the product was made of recycled material. And so we're fostering, if you like, a, uh, the economy going more circular by implementing a form of pricing that reflects the embodied carbon content of what we are producing. Right. So um, <laughs> you're suggesting um, something similar to a carbon tax, or maybe that that is the definition for a carbon tax. Yeah, I think I think um, you, another way you could imagine this and conceive of this, particularly in a country like ours, as I say, where we're importing a lot of um, primary materials and, and so forth, is you could actually, in the interim, you could link the carbon price the tax level that you were going to um, set to the sort of prices that were being um, realised in the market for carbon allowances in the trading scheme. But the problem with that is those prices are going up and down all the time because they're traded prices, much like commodities. And so it's very difficult to sort of fix a particular um, rate at which you might be from one day to, to another. Uh, which you might be taxing the embodied and uh, carbon content of, of materials. So I think, you know, as long as we don't have a global scheme, and I'm not sure that we've really got time enough to wait and just see whether that might materialise, as long as we don't have that, then I think it would, seems to me incumbent, particularly on the more sort of developed um, economies, to actually consider 
how they can actually take into account the, the embodied carbon content of whatever it is that they're consuming. Right, and, and um, given um, given what we're talking, um, it seems like there is this um, huge difference. Um, well, uh, I mean, we know that there is a huge difference on how developed countries can act on certain issues and uh, how the developing countries can act on certain issues. And you were talking about how um, the emissions are just being um, uh, transported from one place to, uh, you know, a uh, poorer place where, you know, most of the production could happen to make the goods cheaper. So um, coming to that um, issue, so uh, we have a question from Harijan Das who asks, that, who asks um, what do you think is um, happening de in developing countries when it comes to um, circular economy? Um, and, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, how are they, how, how is the concept or, how are these concepts being taken up and you know, what kind of KPIs or uh, KPI performance indicators are, are they using? I mean, uh, do you think? Uh, okay, interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to claim to be an expert here um, on terms of what's happening uh, in, in many of the developing countries. I, I know something, but um, I'm, I'm by no means uh, an expert. So a few comments that um, might be appropriately caveated, should we say. First of all, I think it's, you know, from, from certainly from what I know and from what I've um, seen in, in some countries, uh, the role of the informal sector is very important in, in developing countries in terms of capturing materials for recycling. Uh, they tend to be the people who are doing that recycling in the, in the early days. Um, uh, the, the other thing is that consumption levels tend to be obviously somewhat lower and, um, and when we look at the types of waste that's being generated, interestingly, we tend to find higher quantities of sort of wet organic waste um, that seem to be generated in those, in those countries. In, in terms of where the circular economy is going, um, which bit I guess is what we could say, I think um, and it's incredibly difficult, I, I, I would suggest, to, to, to entirely generalize about that. But we've um, got uh, vast differences in levels of consumption. Uh, we have um, many companies playing quite important roles there. Um, it's interesting to note, obviously, that uh, some of the developed countries who are collecting materials for recycling are exporting them to, to uh, developing countries often for reprocessing. So there's a there's a sort of almost like a, um, a trade link going on in terms of how second materials are being extracted and utilized. Um, it's yeah, lots of things we could talk about, about um, right. different aspects of this. In terms of what businesses are doing, it's an interesting one because uh, I think um, we see, I, I've certainly seen some very interesting cases of major uh, corporations um, looking very closely at the quality of their industrial processes and trying to make those fairly efficient. Um, on the other hand, in terms of how can we uh, make sure going forward that our uh, economies in, in, in the, the, the developing economies are driven more circular. One of the things that has worried me is the um, attention being given to uh, shifting simply out of landfill and into energy from waste incineration and so forth. Um, my concern with uh, that is that um, the the, the 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 climate change imperative that it seems to me is looming large over many much of what we do uh, suggests that that might not be a particularly good solution going forward. Um, the reason I say that is that to the extent that there's a you know reasonable plastic component of waste that's being combusted that plastic component has a fossil carbon element which is liberated more or less instantaneously into the atmosphere so it gives rise to fossil co2 emissions and uh, yes we might get some energy back 
typically in the developing countries, I suspect it's more likely to be electricity than heat in many of them. And the thing is that what I notice happening in several of the developing countries, they're recognizing that the, one of the cheapest forms of energy generation now, electricity generation, is going to be solar. And so at the margin, we're putting in place something that's quite a carbon intense form of energy generation at a time when there's an increasing recognition that some of the lowest cost forms of energy are zero carbon ones. And um, I go back to the point I was making earlier about how countries are reporting to the UN under the waste chapter. And if all you're reporting is principally emissions from landfills, it looks as though you're doing a great job just by taking waste away from landfills and putting them into incineration plants. But of course, those emissions should be reported under the stationary combustion chapter of the IP, uh, under the, the UN reporting framework. And we often lose that when we're, when we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions from waste management. We end up only looking at the chapter five emissions that are reported under that chapter called waste, which are almost exclusively directed towards landfilling. Right, no, no, it makes sense. Um, I mean, um, uh, I think every country goes through so many priorities and climate change being one, one of the biggest, but um, we also have priorities to reduce toxicity in our you know, overall production systems and also reduce consumption overall. I mean, uh, these seem to be, uh, you know, one of the top priorities for us, you know, for our plan moving forward, at least looking from a um, production and um, raw materials perspective. Um, so uh, let's let's get to the uh, next topic. Uh, this is something to deal with uh, the timelines because when, when we are talking about, um, uh, I mean, I've been in many conferences and meetings and then whenever we talk about um, issues like this, we often, um, miss, uh, we, we often don't address the short term, long term, and medium term impacts of uh, different decisions we take. Um, and uh, you know, and not just that, but also the short, medium, and long term priorities that we have. Uh, you know, as as a as the local priorities, national and global priorities that we have. I mean, these seem to always be um, ignored in many discussions. So, um, putting that, putting like in that context, so. How, how do you think a price on pollution um, impacts uh, the circular economy and sectors like waste management, which are very much connected to, you know, um, moving towards a circular economy? What do you think the short, medium and, you know, long term uh, impacts are on, on this concept for price on pollution? Uh, like you mentioned, a carbon tax. Okay, um, I mean, it's in, there are very few countries who've included waste within the emissions trading scheme. And I think Possibly New Zealand is just one of one of the small number that has done. Um, the it, there's different ways again of doing this. In, in most countries, um, uh, in, in the European Union, virtually every country now, with the exception of Luxembourg, Slovakia, and Germany, has a landfill tax. And those landfill taxes vary from quite low levels, a few euros per tonne, to the one here in the UK and the one that has been in place in the Netherlands, which are approaching, depending on the exchange rate, um, approaching 100 euros per tonne. And those, those are interesting instruments. They, don't, they, they, they are basically in, intended, fundamentally, to um, to reflect the damages associated with uh, landfilling, but also to actually drive the economics of recycling, which are generally, um, they, they generally stand or fall on the cost you avoid by not throwing things away. So the more the cost of throwing things away increases, the more likely local authorities, businesses, industry, and so forth, the more likely they are to seek to reduce the amount of waste they generate, to make sure they're recycling what they do generate or reusing it, and to actually minimize the amount of throwing away. And it's increasingly common now in Europe to see 
uh, incineration also being taxed. We've seen that in, uh, we see the highest rates is in Denmark. We also see it in Catalonia and Spain, in the Netherlands. Uh, we used to have it in Sweden and in Norway and um, Belgium as well, Austria. So uh, a wide range of countries starting to introduce taxes on incineration. And uh, the Danish one now incidentally related to CO2 emissions. So the um, so the the, the, the picture is um, the, the, that's a that's a very basic thing that can happen in in most countries. The places where it's less likely to happen are those where costs are going to fall directly on municipalities and hence um, uh, households in those situations where households have very low incomes. So what do we do? Well, in those situations, I think it's important that we start to make sure that producers pay their way and start to internalize those things in order to get those things in the price of what people consume. Now, um, the concept of extended producer responsibility is well known, and there's now increasing uh, interest in... So first of all, I think it's important that producers are... What, like, what, what is it that I think lies behind producer responsibility? For me, for me, in part of the rationale for producer responsibility comes, it's partly related to what Robert was uh, describing earlier, but part of it to me is down to the uh, social license to operate uh, um, on the part of those who are selling us whatever it is that we're consuming. Um, what would happen if we if I or other people in the country where I live, or indeed in New York, what would happen if there was no waste collection? And what would happen to the stuff that people were consuming and the packaging that's generated and the stuff that, you know, um, fails to work anymore that can't be repaired? You have this enormous quantity of stuff that we're generating. And if nobody took it away, then what would we be saying? And I think that it's right that producers um, see a role for themselves in managing the end of life fate of the materials, which are a consequence of our consuming their product. So I see it, I see it in some ways as a sort of social license to operate. And if you see it in that way, then I think it's not unreasonable that producers, producers should play a role in um, ensuring that the, the, the products of their, of their products and packaging being consumed are well managed. And I think the principles that we have here now, which are full cost recovery of the collection of that material, not just in terms of the material that's recycled, but also the stuff that didn't get recycled, it was still in the, the mixed waste, if you like, and recovering the cost of littering, and increasingly trying to make sure that people who put products on the market that are difficult to recycle are actually charged more for doing that than those whose products are designed so that they can be easily recycled. So it becomes another form of economic signal back to the producers that actually right. we don't want you to be putting, and by the way, it's not in your interest, to be putting products onto the market that just can't be recycled. Right. And, and um, um, when it comes to extended producer responsibility, which is also a type of price on pollution, um, um, it's not just extended producer responsibility, is it? it's also extended producer and consumer responsibility because the consumer is also yeah. paying for it. Um, so uh, it's an extended uh, responsibility on everyone in the um, chain, in the, in the value chain that's, that's producing or buying the product so that uh, finally I mean, this also relates to environmental justice. You know, your choice, your your choice of product impacting someone else's life somewhere else yeah. um, on the planet. You know, whether through uh, climate change or whether through uh, plastic pollution. You know, which is a big issue now. Um, so uh, it, it's not just producer responsibility that that we're talking about here. No, it is consumers as well, and uh, and but of course, it, consumers are then to the extent that those uh, decisions significantly influence price of what's consumed, consumers then can choose, as it were, 
to make their decisions based upon something that at least nominally reflects uh, something about the environmental impact of, of what they're consuming. It, it would be wrong, I think, to call that necessarily a price on pollution, of course, because it's, it's, you know, that's a slightly more complicated um, and we, we'd have to go back up the, uh, the supply chain in a sense to make sure we were taxing the, all of the um, all of the emissions that were associated with production. And that, but, but can I just make a point about that last that offer out? Yeah. more general point? We've done a lot of studies looking at um, the potential for environmental fiscal reform across the European Union. And, you know, the average um, proportion of GDP that is covered by taxes on things that have an environmental impact is something of the order of 2.5% of GDP. And 2.5% of GDP, most European member states have a tax burden that's of the order of 40% of GDP. And if, if um, countries start to really you know, start to push um, their environmental tax agenda more, uh, more firmly, as it were, then if you look at the sorts of rates that people choose to set those taxes at the moment, they get, a, get to around 4% of GDP, which would be about 10% of the total tax take. Now, all the other taxes are on profits, on income, on consumption, value-added tax, VAT, and on labour. And you've, you've typically got, you know, the, 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 the balance of the, the burden of taxation falls upon those things, none of which we really ought to be um, taxing. You could say VAT is a sort of approximately capturing about consumption, but, but it, it catches value. It doesn't capture the environmental impact uh, of consumption. And so one of, the, one, of, one of the interesting things I think we also need to explore is as corporations and their, you know, as they get more footloose and it becomes actually more difficult to, to, to tax the, um, whatever it is they're doing, shouldn't we be making much stronger efforts to shift the burden of taxation away from labour, from profit, from, uh, um, from income and onto environmental uh, pollution? And um, you can only tax at the level of the externality, at the you know the economists measuring the externalities associated with things. Well, and they say, well, look, we shouldn't we shouldn't tax these pollution these pollutants too heavily because we don't want to go above and beyond their damage cost. But what? Do, how do we set the taxes on on income and labour? We don't go and say, well, what's the optimal tax on labour? Because arguably the optimal tax on labour would be probably zero. Why do we want to tax people's work? Why do we want to make it more difficult for me as an employer to take on more people? I'd much rather my tax burden came from things that I didn't want <laughs> to see and that I was taxing pollution, uh, whether it be um, not from stationary emitters or particulate matter or carbon dioxide or... And, and to be honest, you know, I think we should be much more radical than we've been in looking to really shift the burden of taxation away from, uh, away from um, labour, profits, uh, income, and on to pollution. And I think that's strongly commensurate with a sort of more circular economy, because what it says is it says... Um, if I've got more labour intense activities where I'm going to uh, manufacture things more carefully and I, if I want to make sure I have reuse loops um, where people are going to be using their labour to uh, repair products that have become faulty, it's going to be much more difficult if I'm taxing the labour itself and the income of that, of that employee than if, I, than if I was doing so at a lower rate. And it right. are much more likely to shift production and consumption to less polluting activities if I'm capturing the, 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 the um, impact of those and the price of what I'm buying and producing. 
Right, right. No, so it makes total sense. I mean, uh, when you said that um, you would want to tax something that you don't want to see, I mean, labor and employment is something that everyone likes to see. So uh, uh, that was, uh, I think that kind of summarizes. Yeah, I, what, what I meant is I, I don't want to see taxes on the, on the things that, on the things I want to see encouraged. I want to see them tax less. And I think it's quite strange that we've ended up with some economies with really high taxes on uh, labor, um, right. with relatively low taxes on pollution. And uh, I, 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 you know, uh, it's, not, it's not even helpful to stimulate the economy. Mm -hmm. And, and um, Dom, so um, just uh, we have only um, five minutes and we've gotten a lot of questions on carbon trading. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll not be able to ask all the questions, but um, could you touch upon that? What has been your experience? And then, you know, how does that fit in the price on pollution, uh, you know, discussion that we're having today? Uh, you know, is it being discussed in the circular economy circles and, you know? Yeah, I think I think it's interesting. I mean, my it's it's virtually the unanimous um, call, I would say, in public policy terms, of from those people who are interested in the circular economy. But the challenge is, how do you do it? And I I don't underestimate those challenges because, of course, if you're going to tax, as I was suggesting earlier, for example, the embodied carbon content of say. Um, a computer, then you've got a huge number of different components, some of which may be made from secondary materials, some from primary. How do we do that? I don't think this is going to happen tomorrow, but I think it's something we should, we, we, we're going to have to do it, feels to me. In the, in the era of big data, in the era of um, things that are going into my fridge, being able to talk to uh, something uh, telling me that my um, lettuce is out of date, <laughs> and I need to consume it tomorrow. Uh, it, uh, it, in the area of that sort of um, complexity, I don't think this is beyond the wit of, our, um, of humanity to, to address. And I think we should start to think about how we're going to go forward in these ways. And, and I suspect it might not, it might not happen for 10 years. I think you can do proxies in between. Like I was saying earlier, you could say, um, what is typically the traded price of carbon, therefore we're going to tax all imported products um, on the basis of an average uh, estimate of the embodied carbon content, unless you, the importer, can show us that your production processes gave rise to a lower level of carbon emissions. And if you can show us that, we'll tax you less of the border. So I think we can do that, and that's uh, as long as we do that in a fair way. That's eligible under WTO rules. Right, right, great. Thank you. And um, so uh, we also got, got a question from Nairobi um, from uh, Wikesa, and um, I think uh, what um, I think the the question is. So uh, we were talking about uh, production being shifted to um, developing countries. And um, how can we change um, uh, that? How can we change the perception that those are cheap jobs that are going to developing countries from making those are sustainable jobs for you know the entire economy, um, where these jobs could actually um, do environmental good? Um, so I think that's what the question is. So could we have a minute to respond and then maybe conclude. Okay, well, I, I mean, I don't think they need to be is the answer, and I and I uh, and I suspect that were we to be making sure we were taxing on basis of consumption rather than production, or just on production, as it were, that um, we would be sending signals back to those people producing in all countries, and, and indeed within our own country, that what we wanted to see was um, the use of cleaner technology in production, and hence um, we'd be consuming products with a lower, should we say, pollution content. And indeed, hopefully, that would give rise to improved conditions in, in the countries themselves. Right, right. And um, uh, based on my experience in the sector, I believe, um, uh, I think a combination of EPR and uh, real price on pollution, you know, which uh, accounts for um, the embodied um, emissions, I think that is probably one of the achievements that um, is ahead of us that we should uh, you know, all work towards um, getting there because that 
that will be one of the largest impacts that we can have on 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 the future for, for, for the future generation so um Don, thanks for joining us today, and uh, thanks for your time. Uh, I know there's been some confusion with the time, but thanks for being so accommodating. No problem. No, thank you very much for, yeah. for having me and for those who listened in. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Ranjit, for setting this up. It's been very fun. Right, great. Thanks. So, um, uh, thank you, Don. So, um, see you again. And see you soon. Hopefully, we'll do um, Fred, so uh, we've had. Uh, so friends, um, yeah, uh, so we've had uh, more than uh, 230 registrations when I checked last time before um, coming on. So thank you so much for your support. I mean, this really um, helps us. Uh, we've been putting a lot of time into um, uh, making uh, global dialogues on waste and be waste wise work. And um, uh, uh, I mentioned this during the beginning of the session, which is uh, in addition to global dialogues on waste, we also do, uh, we also publish uh, the waste pioneers list and we have interviews and sessions with them um, happening and they're already being published so check them out and additionally um, uh, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm actively seeking employment so what I've learned during this time is that there is no single um, uh, platform or place where we could actually find good uh, uh, in the sector in the waste management research for economy sector so uh, what we're doing is you know, just another drop in the ocean, which is uh, we want to, uh, if you have any job opportunities, then let us know and then we'll put them, uh, we'll uh, publish them in our newsletter and we'll also publish them on our LinkedIn group so that you know you, you could reach more people and then in the long term, this might act as a platform for people who are also looking for jobs. So, um, so if you have any um, such um, opportunities, let us know and then we'll help you. And another thing is, if you're a contributor, if you've been a panelist on Be Waste Wise, you could also use our newsletter as a, we send something called the community newsletter. So if you have any articles written or if you have any updates uh, that you would like people to know about, you know, send them to us and then we will, you know, put them through our newsletter um, uh, and send it to all our subscribers. So um, thank you. And um, I think uh, with this, the live interviews for uh, this theme are over. And we have a pre-recorded interview with um, Alexander Lemel. And um, as soon as uh, we're done on this, I'll send you an email to that, to all, all the people who have registered. So um, I think you should get the email in another uh, five minutes. So um, you'll get a chance to um, watch it entirely. And if you have any questions, since it's a pre-recorded interview, if you have any questions, send it to us, and then we'll get them answered on Twitter or uh, via email. So. Thank you very much and um, have a have a good day, good night, and um, good evening, and um, see you guys. Thanks.